from NJ.com. This is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome on in, Giants fans, to episode 146 of the Talk is Cheap podcast right here on NJ.com. As always, I'm Matt Lombardo, joined by my friend and colleague, Ryan Dunleavy. And Ryan, I'm sure this isn't the podcast the Giants fans were hoping to hear after the Eagles game, a 25-22 to loss following a two-game winning streak that gave the Giants a little bit of hope that maybe there could be a run towards an NFC East championship after knocking off the, the Super Bowl champions. Uh, now you have a team at three and eight with no realistic possibility of making the postseason no path to the playoffs and you have a Chicago Bears team that's very very good coming into MetLife on Sunday and Ryan I think we both got this sense on Sunday the finger pointing has begun within this locker room yeah I mean you were there for Shepard and Beckham uh I don't know I don't know about the finger pointing but I know about this I know I was absolutely right not to buy on this podcast last week I said don't buy the two game winning streak I said I thought it was a product of the Giants not being the worst team in the NFL and teams like the Bucks and 49ers being worse I think if the Giants played the Raiders and Cardinals they probably would have had a four game winning streak but you gave them a good team and they did exactly what they've done all season which is just enough to lose uh jumped out to a 19-3 lead and which was new and found a way to gag it away so um, sure, you're right. I think you're referring to Shepard and Beckham after the game, kind of questioning the play calling, uh, something Pat Shermer poo-pooed, but I think was very real. Um, I think they they were both unhappy. Look, every time you stick a microphone in their face, they uh, support Eli Manning. I think they're both unhappy with not just the play calling, but the play execution, which falls on the quarterback. Um, look, I think it's just frustration mounting over and over. You and I are talking and writing about the same thing week after week while those guys are living the same thing week after week. So imagine how frustrating it is for them. Yep, no doubt. And we're going to try to make the final four and a half, five weeks of the season not frustrating. So if you'd love to subscribe to the the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, you can find us on Google Play and YouTube. We'd really appreciate you subscribing on iTunes and the Apple Podcast Store and leaving us those five-star reviews. But, Ryan, certainly frustrations were boiling over after the game. And I think that rather than diving into the minutia of a 25-22 to loss and how you coughed up a 19-3 to lead, uh, just to kind of go, go off of those comments. Sterling Shepard said after the game, you can go back and watch the film as well. Can you go back, watch it and tell me what you see? Odell Beckham Jr. went a step further. Honestly, that's a question for coach. That's not my question. I don't call the plays. I just do what I'm told to do. I go out there and execute whenever I get the opportunity to do something. I try to make the most of it. If I don't get as many opportunities, all I can do is what I can do when I have the opportunity to catch the football. Um, Coming in, knowing they're struggling in the secondary, personally, I would have loved to attack them but that wasn't in our game plan. And I I don't know, again, I think that both Shepard and Beckham were criticizing the play calling, and I agree with you. I think that it was the execution of the plays because there were several plays in that game, and you can go right back to the Eli Manning interception at the end of the first half that really started to turn the tide of the game. You had both Corey Coleman and Saquon Barkley open underneath who you get the ball to either one of those guys. It's a guaranteed first down. You get it to Barkley. It's probably a touchdown, and you go into the locker room up 26 to 11 and you're looking at a very different football game and I think there's an element to questioning the play calling but also the inability for Eli Manning to make plays deep down the field and we've seen it throughout the course of the year right whether it was the interception whether it was throwing to the wrong uh, open tight end on the two-point try down along the goal line against the Atlanta Falcons whether it was not audibling out of a Saquon Barkley run and throwing to a hot route to an unguarded Odell Beckham Jr. along the goal line against San Francisco and the play that we just talked about against the Eagles. Ryan, eventually, if the scheme is working, and those examples and many other throughout the course of the year show that it is, eventually Eli Manning needs to be held accountable for not making those plays and the mistakes such as the interception that very clearly, in my opinion at least, was the beginning of the end to costing the Giants that game. Yeah, but the Giants don't have anybody on the depth chart to play. They don't have another quarterback that's ready. They That's the... That's what we're reading other places. That's what, you know, Giants friendly sources appear to be saying. Um, So how do you hold Manning accountable, Matt, if there's no other quarterback on the roster ready to play? You you play the kid. 
Or right? you don't cut Davis Webb, or you don't cut the de- or you don't cut the guy who had the best training camp and was your and had a year of experience being groomed for the job. I don't care if the other regime picked him. I don't care if he went unclaimed on waivers. You dedicated a year to the guy so that he would be ready for this moment. Maybe that's what you don't do. Maybe that's it. You know, if you knew, maybe you don't make it. Maybe you sign a quarterback better than Alex Tanney, who has played in some games, even if it's re-signing Geno Smith or some Geno Smith carbon copy who has at least started 30-ish games in the NFL. Maybe you sign that guy. Maybe you don't leave yourself with zero other options, and then you don't get to use, oh, we have zero options as the excuse. It's total chicken and the egg. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with a lot of that, and, and you and I have our disagreements about Davis Webb, but the one thing where I think you're absolutely correct is he had a year in this locker room, not necessarily in this scheme, but in this locker room, and he did have a solid training camp, but in my Matt, opinion, I Ryan, asked, Matt, you were at every training camp practice standing next to me. Who, who, which quarterback of the four in camp, including Eli Manning, from April 20th when they gathered before the draft until September First cut day. Who had the of the four quarterbacks? Who was the most impressive to you? Practice and games. Well, pra- the- pra- well, I think that it, in terms of practices, Davis Webb, especially for the first week and a half of camp, looked like a starting NFL quarterback. I thought he really tailed off in the second half of camp and never really recovered after that first preseason so who, game. So who was the best, Manning? Who do you I, think was the best? Oh, the overall, four. I'd say Davis Webb. But again, okay, I, that's I, my but, but, here, but here's but here's the thing, though. I, I've covered other NFL quarterbacks. I've I've covered Michael Vick in training camp. I've covered Carson Wentz. I've covered Nick Foles. Like you know what? I've I've seen what an NFL quarterback looks like, and and Webb looked like a middle of the road middling quarterback. And again, it's his second year, and he had never started a game, and maybe that's what he's supposed to look like. But I, I didn't think that. Uh, you know, you look at the difference between Manning and Webb. I, I don't think either one, by the end of training camp, looked leaps and bounds better than the other. And I think that if you're the Giants and you rattle off but, a one and seven start, it's on you at some point during that stretch to get Kyle Lalletta ready because you know that you're not going to go 16 games with Eli Manning. That's a failure of the organization. That's a failure from Pat Shermer on down, your coaching staff. It's a failure for Dave Gettleman not to have an edict to Pat Shermer to get the kid ready for the final four or five games of the season when you're one and seven. It's the equivalent of me spend. It's the equivalent of me spending all the money in my bank account uh, on a trip to Vegas, then coming home and complaining that I can't pay my rent. Like, no, that's not how this happens. You don't get to make the mistakes, not pick a quarterback in the draft, not sign a free agent quarterback, cut your last quarterback, and then say we have no quarterback. No, that's not how this works. And you what's want- funny about that, Ryan, is you go back to the day that Davis Webb was released, and Pat Shermer stood at the podium and talked about Kyle Oletta's quick diagnosis of a defense, his quick release. He gets rid of the football on time and on target and all of those things. We've heard whispers within the Giants organization that they were intended to play Kyle Lalletta at some point. You can't after a 25 to 22 loss with five games remaining, you can't say that we don't have better options because you invested a fourth round pick in a young quarterback. And that was five, six months ago. This was a year ago. And the reason you didn't feel the need to pick one, you could pick Saquon Barkley, is because you felt you had better quarterback options between Webb, Laletta, whatever. You saw Laletta, you thought he'd be available when you needed him in the middle of the rounds. He was, hallelujah. So now you didn't need to pick Darnold or Rosen or Allen. And now all of a sudden you don't have better options. Look, they haven't said this. This is just sources that we've seen other places. They haven't actually said this. Uh, I think you plan to ask Shermer today if Laletta's flat out ready to go in a game yep. I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he'll say yes uh but uh you know Manning gives us the best chance to win right now we're trying to win games which is silly time. by the way which is silly you're, you're three and eight okay you're three and eight with you traded game. snacks and apple you right. traded your, yeah, I mean, come on. You're not trying to win games. Right. Yeah, and, and there's no reason to win games at this point. You're, you're, you're playing R.J. McIntosh and B.J. Hill up front. Uh, Grant Haley has stepped in and become your highest graded pro football focused defender. And that's all well and good. These are rookies. These are kids. This is what three and eight football teams do. If you're trying to build something for 2019 and beyond, you play the kids. You don't play the 37 year old quarterback who's missed enough opportunities to put you in a position to be three and seven. You turn 
the page, you rip the Band-Aid off, you move on. Because, Ryan, uh, uh, how many times have I harped on this over the last month and a half that if and when the Giants fall out of contention, which they have, you can make an argument they were out of contention at 1-7, and seven, they needed to get as much data as they can on Kyle Lalletta. Yep. Whether he's ready or not, you need to throw the kid to the wolves. Yep. You need to play him so you know whether you have to take Will Greer, yep. whether you have to take Justin Herbert, yep. Dwayne Haskins, or anybody, or you can take the opportunity to, to draft a generational pass rusher. Yeah, look, they are in sports no man's land. It's the worst place a franchise can be. It's you're not bad enough to get the draft picks to rebuild and you're not good enough to contend. It's literally the worst place you can be. A lot of a lot of franchises live there. Uh, you know, the Jets have lived there for years. The Knicks were were the, now the Knicks are pretty much the worst team, but the Knicks were there for like a decade. Uh, it's the worst place you can be. You're the eighth worst team in your professional sports league. It's the worst thing you can be. Yep. And the question I have for you, Ryan, is where do you go from here? What's next? I mean, where I would go is I would pl- I would play Laletta after this game against the Bears. I would not playing Laletta against the Bears is like throwing a kitten to the wolves. It makes no sense. The Bears are going to destroy the Giants offensive line. Uh, it just seems unfair, like ruining a kid's confidence to play him against the Bears. So I would play Eli Manning. I'm assuming you're going to lose. And then I would play him against the Redskins and get my four weeks of data. Where the Giants are going to go is anybody's guess. I mean, Pat Sh- Shermer actually said the words, why are you jumping over Alex Tanny? And so I, I said, you know what? Why are we jumping over Alex Tanny? So I contacted the Elias Sports Bureau and I asked them, How many times has a quarterback made his first career start at age 31 or later, which is what would happen. Tanny's 31 and he's made, he's played in one game with no starts. This is unbelievable, by the way, continue. (laughs) You told me this offline. I've read it, but, but please, please finish. Cause this is uh, people will fall off their chair or drive off the road when they hear this. I said, well, that being said, consider that a warning from your friend, Matt Lombardo, pull over, put on your blinker. Um, Yes. So how many times has a quarterback in the NFL started a first career game at age 31 or later? Because like, you know, oh, maybe he's Kurt Warner, right? Maybe, you know, no. It, 31 or later, the only time in the last 30 years, one time, and it's Doug Peterson, who has become a Super Bowl winning head coach of the Eagles, but was a bad NFL quarterback. Basically, he was Drew, uh, Dan Marino's backup. He was Brett Favre's backup. He was nobody's starter. He was the bridge to Donovan McNabb in Philly, and I grew up watching that team. Ryan, I can tell you that when you look around and you watch that 1999 uh, Eagles team, it was a countdown clock every week until when are you going to play the kid? When are you going to play Donovan? Donovan McNabb would come in in the second half of games. He'd come in in the fourth quarter of games. But Doug Peterson was cannon fodder in 1999. Then he went on to the Browns, and he struggled there. He was Alex Tandy. He was. Alex Tanny is what and he that's was. It. So why are so to answer Pat Shermer's question, why are you skipping over Alex Tanny? Because 30 years of NFL history tell me that that's the right thing to do. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I can't argue with that. I can't make a case to play Alex Tanny. And the only thing, and I've gone back and I've listened to that press conference on my drive home. I've, I've thought about it. And that really was a seminal moment of this season when you could feel it in the room. When Pat Schirmer said, why are you jumping over Alex Tanny? We all kind of got the thought, they're actually going to do this. They're actually going to at some point play a 31-year-old backup quarterback who's been on eight other teams, played in one game in his entire career, and the Giants are going to somehow fool themselves into thinking that he has some upside in 2018 and beyond, which I think is silly. But my point here is that when you look at the, the possibility of playing Alex Tanney, it's no different than playing Eli Manning. It's no different. And, and there's no chance that even in his diminished state of his diminished skill set, that Eli Manning doesn't give you a better chance to win games no than chance. Alex Tanny does. No chance. So if you're playing Alex Tanny, you're doing it because you're like, oh, maybe he's the quarterback in the future. Who knows? Well, he's not. So uh, when you're playing, you got to, again, you're either playing Manning to win games or you're playing Loletta for the future. Tanny is 
probably a nice guy, but he's in the middle here. He has he's in you know, he's the Giants. He's in no man's land. He's not the future. He's not the present. So he's on the roster because he's good at grooming young players. He because he can go into the game in a pinch and as a veteran who knows the playbook, he doesn't need much practice time. He can go in in a pinch, lead a drive if Eli Manning gets you know injured for a needs to miss a series or whatever. Go in for a play if Manning's helmet comes off. Whatever, that's fine. But to actually turn to him as the future, this is the Giants not learning from their mistakes. This is last year going from Manning to Geno Smith with the plan to eventually get to Davis Webb, an anniversary that happened this week. Uh, that's what this is all over again. And a year later for the Giants to make the same mistake, at least Geno Smith had played like 30 games. There was a possibility that Geno Smith might have some. He was a former second round pick. He had experience. Yeah, he came with a tarnished reputation because he'd all he failed with the Jets right across town. If he had failed with like the Cardinals, maybe it wouldn't have been different. He wouldn't have been Geno Smith. Uh per se, but now you're going to go do the same thing only with someone who's not nearly as good as Geno Smith. It makes no sense. A year later, the Giants, despite 7 million media articles, despite grumbling fans, despite admitting, John Mara admitting they should have taken a closer look at Davis Webb last year, they're now going to not take a closer look at Kyle Laletta. I mean, they, I mean, they talk, they do one thing and say another. It's quarterback malpractice is what it yeah. is. And that, that might even be the, the the title to this episode. It's quarterback malpractice because th- there's no upside. There's no reason to play Alex Tanney. And the clock is ticking on when you can play Kyle Lalletta. I agree with you. I, I think that you play Kyle Lalletta on the road at FedEx Field against Washington. That's a winnable football game at this point. It's a chance for him to build some confidence. And, and then you have a couple of games the rest of the way. Tennessee is a playoff caliber team. That would be a real test for the kid. You go to Indianapolis on Christmas weekend. And that's a team right in the thick of the AFC South race. And you come back to uh, a game against the Dallas Cowboys, which it could either be for the division championship for the Cowboys or they could have everything wrapped up. But you could really set yourself up here to get a solid sample size of data to know what you need to do at that position next year. Wouldn't that be nice rather than fooling yourselves yeah. into thinking that a 37 year old quarterback. And again, I, I still believe from a long term team building philosophy that having Saquon Barkley helps a young quarterback quarterback reaches potential quicker and if you don't believe in the quarterbacks in the draft class you take the running back but you don't fool yourself into thinking that adding Saquon Barkley with this particular quarterback is good enough to help you compete that would that was a miscalculation on their part and they're in danger of repeating it here's my problem too if you're gonna go back to Eli Manning in 2019 which I guess is an option maybe at a pay cut or if you're gonna go to Nick Foles or Teddy Bridgewater or anything that isn't drafting Justin Herbert. And I, look, I guess you could draft one of these other guys, Will Greer or Daniel Jones, but I'm far from sold on these guys. And that doesn't mean anything, right? If the Giants are sold on, look at Patrick Mahomes. He was the third quarterback picked in his yep. draft, and he's he's unbelievable. Uh, Deshaun Watson was the second quarterback picked in that draft. He's very good. The uh, Mitch Trubisky was first. He's very good. And that was a draft. No one thought the quarterbacks were any good. That's why the Browns took, uh, miles Jarrett with the first pick because the, everybody was unsure about the quarterbacks. And now it looks like they have three pro bowl caliber quarterbacks in that draft. So look, you can be wrong about quarterbacks. I can be wrong about quarterbacks, but anything other than quickly this year or maybe 2020 if you suck so bad that you end up with the first pick and you get Tua from Alabama who's definitely the first pick in the 2020 draft anything other than that and you are just wasting Odell Beckham who is who he could be 30 32 33 by the time you find your next quarterback Saquon Barkley could be 26 by the time you find your next quarterback and in 26 as a running back is basically the same as 33 as a wide yeah. receiver yeah. so i mean you're just wasting these years with these incredible players because you because you don't have your next quarterback in line and i'm not even saying playing right now you don't ha- you don't know who it is it's a question mark that that's a problem and you don't have the offensive line and look, get them and try to do the offensive line. Jerry Reese failed to address the offensive line for the most part. Yes. He used a first round pick on flowers. Yes. He used one on pew, but he didn't do enough to address the offensive line in one year. Dave Gettleman did more in his one year than Jerry Reese did in any one specific of his years. Uh, and he, cause he used the second round pick. He signed two free agents. The problem is Gettleman whiffed. 
The problem is he picked the wrong guys. Yeah. But at least he tried. So now he's got to do it again. You know he's going to try again. Is it – did he just have a bad year? Did he just whiff? Or is he not great at evalu- – him and staff not great at evaluating offensive linemen? I don't think they're they going to whiff again. I don't think they whiffed on Will Hernandez. I think center w- was a mistake. I think that Patrick Omame uh, was a fail-safe option after they lost out on Andrew Norwell. And, uh, you know, bringing Eric Flowers back and even and playing Solder him hasn't been, was Solder a hasn't lived. Solder hasn't lived up to his contract. No, He's I been agree. okay. He's been okay, but he hasn't been – they paid him like a pro bowler. And that's the bigger picture issue here, Ryan, is that we can sit here and spend 35 minutes on a podcast talking about how the Giants have uh, mismanaged the quarterback position, which is the most important position in all of sports, but they have other holes. And and they they have mismanaged everything. They They mismanaged center. They have a hole at, at, at right tackle. You can argue that maybe Jamone Brown has a chance to playing his way into the right guard role, even though I thought he struggled mightily against Fletcher Cox and the Eagles. And those, 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 those guys aren't going anywhere. You have to play those guys twice a year, every year. You need, need to be better than just average against maybe the best defensive line in football. Um, you still need to figure out what you're doing at tight end because they've decreased Evan Ingram's snaps each and every week over the last three weeks. And then he has the hamstring injury before the game on Sunday. You look at the defense, you're getting nothing out of your pass rush you're getting nothing out of your inside linebacker spot Th- those are five six hold positions hold on oh, we've you, gotten free safety you, yet you haven't gotten free safety but Curtis Curtis. Riley may be the worst starter on the entire team that's I seven mean, positions yeah. seven positions that you need to address while you have top heavy superstar MVP caliber talent and Saquon Barkley and Odell Beckham Jr. and Landon Collins if and Landon, Landon Collins if Landon Collins was playing next to a free safety who could play center field. And I'm not saying Ed Reed. I'm not saying put him next to a Hall of Famer. I'm saying if he was playing next to a free safety who could play at center field and take good angles and whatnot, Landon Collins could play in the box and be like a superstar linebacker slash strong safety. Instead, Landon Collins has to be all over the field because he's basically the only safety. I agree. I agree. And, and I mean, that just underscores the the monumental rebuild that Dave Gettleman has in front of him. And oh, by the way, they you basically gave away their third round pick to take a cornerback in the supplemental draft this past spring. So you don't have a third round pick. You're probably going to have to walk away. But from Sam Al-Gosen. Beal will be back. Sam Beal, by all accounts, Sam Beal. Well, Sam Beal is that third round pick. Yeah, it sucked this year that he hurt his shoulder and is out yeah. but essentially he'll be a rookie next year and that you that took in the that you took in the supplemental draft by the way so i mean listen i i think the kid has a chance to be a player but he went in the supplemental draft um I, I think that when you look at the defense next year you're gonna have to figure out what you're doing at cornerback because who knows if you're gonna bring janoris jenkins back who knows what sam beal is who knows what haley can do beyond playing the nickel and even if he's good enough to to be your starter going into next season you're probably walking away from olivier vernon and alec ogletree ryan alec ogletree's pff grade can i ask you what you think it is so far I this know, year i i know it's really low because pff puts a lot of value on Kyle Coverage. And look, Alec Ogletree is a terrible linebacker in coverage. He's good. Uh, he's good against the run. He can blitz a little bit, which is what they should be doing with him in pass plays. He should not be asked to cover anybody. If he's on the field in a pass play, he should be blitzing. Uh, and he's a tremendous leader. He's exactly what they needed in the locker room at the time they needed him. Does that mean he gets five years here? I Probably not. But he's what they needed for this season as a leader. He's okay as a run stopper, go ahead, tell the grade, because it's all about the fact that he's probably given up like 500 yards receiving in coverage. 37.5. Which is really bad. <laughs> which is the <laughs> lowest, which is the lowest of any Giants defensive player, and it is the 81st ranked linebacker in the league. So there's a chance that you traded a fourth round and a sixth round pick for a guy that you might not bring back next season, which, which is amazing to me because I agree with all the things you said about him being very good against the run, about him being a tremendous leader and what this locker room needed. But there's a position that you thought that you addressed that now has to go on to that offseason shopping list in all likelihood because it just hasn't worked out here yeah i mean like you say it's almost like the 10th ingredient in a like uh in a big i don't eat salads but some sort of like salad where you know you have 10 ingredients like a cop salad with like you throw the kitchen sink in the thing 
Yeah, there you go. Thanks. There you go. This is a spoken like a man who eats more than I do. Um, <laughs> even though you might eat less. Not than by I much. I might, eat, yeah. I might eat fewer items than you do. Yeah, you, I think you might. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. And it's kind of like that. It's kind of like, like, yeah, you need you, you might if you had an endless supply of resources and endless time and endless options, you judge you pro, you could replace Alec Ogletree. But you just rattle off seven things that are more important than Ogletree. You know, except maybe tight end. You know, tight end. You you actually have options at tight end. So, um, yeah. What do we just, make of that, by the way? Uh, again, I, I think, I think it's, take the Giants I, at face value that it was actually a hamstring injury that shut Evan Ingram down on Sunday. I think it was. Eagles. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. But you look at the past two weeks: thirty-six total snaps, thirty-three total snaps. You look at Evan Ingram, and and it's obvious that he's not going to win any awards as a blocker. And, and if you're going to be a run-first team with Saquon Barkley carrying the ball 25 times a game you can't have a non-blocking tight end out there um but but if that's the case i i don't know what you do with evan ingram moving forward i think look i think uh you nailed it they went into the bye week and they came out and said here's our self-diagnosis we're going to run the ball more between the tackles and to do that we're with our average to below average offensive line we're going to give them a sixth offensive lineman and red ellison as and maybe a seventh offensive lineman and elijah penny as a fullback whose whose snaps have gone way way up um so somebody had to be the odd man out there and it's been evan ingram uh, Shermer basically, every time he's asked about Ingram, talks about how he's basically a wide receiver playing tight end. Uh, at first, I thought that sounded like a compliment. Now I realize it's not necessarily a compliment. Um, I Based think, on what they want to do, sure. Correct. Uh, he, I just I think Evan Ingram is the right fit for a team that has five good offensive linemen. Like maybe if you put him on the Saints. Uh, I think the Cowboys. He would, yeah, the Cowboys, uh, the Cowboys who need a tight end badly. I think he'd be a great option for them. I just don't think he's necessarily the, his skill set's right for the Giants because they need a blocking tight end with the rest of their personnel. I don't think Evan Ingram is a bad player. I think Evan Ingram's a very good at what he does. Uh, oh, not to the level of snacks. I don't want to make the snacks comparison. But because uh, Snacks is the best in the league at what he does, but very similar to Snacks in that he has he's the one dimensional player who does something very well. He Snacks stops the run as good as anybody in the NFL. Evan Ingram, I think, could be one of the best pass catching tight ends in the NFL. Uh, Snacks offered no pass rush. Evan Ingram offers very little blocking. And to spin and this thing ahead to ever. Sunday, right. And not for lack of ever, let's be clear. I've asked Evan Ingram about this many times. He is dedicated to blocking. He try, He practices blocking, as silly as that sounds. He try, He studies film. He studies technique. He's out there with teammates trying to work on it. He tries to become a better blocker. It might just not be in his skill set and his body type. Well, then, then I wonder if it's not an issue of coaching, because Zach Ertz with the Eagles went through the same thing his first season. Couldn't get on the field uh, because he, he couldn't stay on the field, rather, because he couldn't block. And Brent Selleck was the blocking option. And, and when it was obvious third and 12 situations or when you were going to throw the ball, Zach Ertz was on the field. Fast forward three years, and Zach Ertz is one of the top three overall tight ends in the league. And, and, and again, I have witnessed in training camp covering that team and in practices the effort that goes into a tight end trying to take his game to that next level and become a more complete blocking tight end. I do wonder if Evan Ingram is putting in the work, why we aren't seeing the results on Sundays of him being a better blocker and being on the field longer. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly something to keep an eye on as we go to next offseason. I don't expect them to trade Ingram, but you know, I didn't expect them to trade Apple. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that if we spin it ahead to Sunday's game against the Bears, this is a team that it, it appears on the surface it's a two-horse race in that division between them and the Minnesota Vikings. And I don't expect to see much Evan Ingram on Sunday because of what the game plan is probably going to have to be uh, to, to try and run the football against that, that front seven. Uh, Ryan, I think that when you look at this game, I, I don't know that Evan Ingram is going to play 30 total snaps. When I look at this game, Matt, I say there's one thing I think. With it, not team versus team, but matchup versus matchup within a, within a game might be the biggest mismatch in the NFL this season. The Bears front seven versus the Giants offensive line is a criminal mismatch. I mean, I, 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 I it's a good thing Eli Manning has 15 years worth of practice on how to take a hit or, you know, shield his body or crumble 
or you know avoid br- brute force because I actually feel bad for Eli Manning. I don't understand how the Giants are going to block the Bears. I don't understand if they're going to block Khalil Mack or Hicks or and if they do, if Eli, if they do hold it up, the Bears have this ball hawking secondary and Eli Manning throughout his career. One knock, even when he was at his best, was that he threw too many interceptions. So even when he's protected, I don't like him putting the ball in the air against this secondary. I mean, I don't like. I mean. I don't like this matchup at all, as you'll see when I give my score prediction in a couple minutes. Yep, no doubt about it. I look at this game, and I think that it's going to be a chance for Cleo Mack to have maybe four sacks. We look at yeah. what, what J.J. Watt did in the uh, in the third week of the season against Chad Wheeler. I, I think that Mack has a chance to have a much bigger day. I think this is going to be tough sliding for the Giants' uh, offense. And I think defensively, even though Chase Daniel is one of those marginal NFL quarterbacks, look at what he did on Thanksgiving. It didn't look like it was that much of a drop-off in that system from Mitchell Trubisky. And there's a lot of talent there with Allen Robinson and Trey Burden and and a couple of running backs that can get the job done. I I think this could really get out of hand quickly for the Giants on both sides of the football. Yeah, I just, on the other side of the football, I mean, I guess the defense could rally around and and play Chase Daniel tough, though the the, the Bears have two good running backs. I mean, I give if the Giants have any chance in this game, it's got to be a low scoring game where they run the ball between the two. Saquon Barkley has to have 27 carries again, and they got to try to win this game. I don't know, to 10 to nine or something like that. Uh, Instead, they're going to they're going to lose it 27 to six. Is what's going to happen here? That, <laughs> that, yeah. that that's how this thing is going to play out, in my opinion. I, I, I you're not that far. I picked 28 to three. Uh, yeah, it sounds like we're both counting on Aldrich Rosas to continue his big year. He's had a nice year, by the way. By the speaking of Rosas, Matt, the Pro Bowl. Did you think that was a shot? Did you think that was a shot at Odell Beckham? When, when I heard it at first, I was kind of like, OK, he's just throwing the kicker a bone. But then you start to think, OK, how many times is Odell Beckham Jr. going in for an IV? I, I, I wouldn't put it past Shermer to take a little jab like that, would you? Um, so I heard it live. Uh, I was listening. So anybody who doesn't know, on Shermer said on the Mike Francesa show on WFAN, uh, asked about Rosas. He said he really likes him. He's a football player. He doesn't care if he's hydrated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the hydration thing, obviously, as soon as I heard it, I raised my eyebrow. I texted somebody and said, do you think that was a shot at Beckham? Um, so as soon as I heard it, I thought maybe. And then I was like, nah, uh, probably not. I, uh, he's talking about how he's more, you know, kickers are. Like a lunch pail guy. I mean, he could yeah, have well, he he said he's a lunch pail guy. He shows up to work on time and he does his job and he, he's a good kicker. Yeah, 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 the, 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 the citing hydration to me. Yeah, exactly. I, the more I think about it, the more I think it probably was a dig at uh, Odell. Yeah, exactly. And the funny thing about all of this is that, you know, Pat Shermer talked about the value of sports science and how important it is. And he's right. Everybody's been doing it. But he was on a staff with Chip Kelly, who Kelly lost his locker room because they went overboard on the sports science. So I think that there's a fine line that Shermer has to walk with all of that. Uh, quickly, Ryan, we, I think we both gave our thoughts on the game on Sunday. Uh, your your final score prediction is? 28-3. Mine's 27 to six. I think the Giants fans got to buckle up and hope that next week against Washington is better. And and I think that we're both in agreement here that next week needs to be the week that they play Kyle Oletta, right? Yep. I wrote that this week. Yeah. You had written yours, you know, a couple weeks ago, Politi had written his after the Eagles loss, I think, uh, or no, after the Redskins. So you wrote it after the first Eagles loss. Yep. Liddy wrote it after the Redskins lost. I finally buckled down after the second Eagles loss and wrote that I think they should play in week 14 against the Redskins. Uh, one thing I want to throw out there, Matt, and see what you think of this, uh, not to, uh, you know, not to uh, self promote too much, but I wrote something I thought was interesting this week. You can, a lot of times you get, you read, you know, you read similar things across, you know, multiple giants writers, but I thought I found some interesting this week. Um, Matt Nagy, the bears coach is eight and three. Uh, Pat Shermer's obviously three and eight. If I rewinded 11 months, you were on the NFL beat. I was literally in my first two or three days. Uh, and Nagy was not nearly the candidate that, Shermer was or Patricia was 
with the Lions or Josh McDaniels was, and we know how that worked out with the Colts, or Steve Wilkes was with the Cardinals. No one seemed to really be talking about Matt Nagy. The Bears snapped, snatched him up right away. Uh, he, I think he was one of the first offseason coaches hired. No one was really talking about him. The Giants didn't include him in their six interview list. Here he is, eight and three, the best of the first-year coaches. What do you make of that? Another terrific Andy Reid branch of the coaching tree. Yeah. Doug Peterson's won a Super Bowl. Uh, you look around the league, and and Andy Reid is is a kingmaker. I mean, and, and I think that Matt Nagy, uh, coming from that coaching tree, coming from that philosophy, is going to be uh, very successful. And I think he's he's already in the running for Coach of the Year, in my opinion. If you don't want to give it to Sean McVay, um, and, and I think that my big picture takeaway is watch out for Eric Bieniemy. He's currently the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's, Eric uh, sleeping with the enemy. Sleeping guy? with the enemy from oh, NFL. Wow. Former wow. running back, I believe he played for Andy Reid at one point. Wow, sleeping with the enemy. That, that if in the 2020 hiring cycle, after he's had two years working with Andy, yeah. if the enemy is not the hot name on the uh, the coaching carousel, that's interesting. And the reason I wrote about it is because. The Giants didn't interview him. And again, this is this is hindsight. Shermer was a good hire when the Giants hired him, and he could still be a good coach. I, I mean, look, he could still be a good coach for sure. Um, but the Giants didn't interview Nagy because Gettleman didn't have Nagy on his list. Well, if the Giants had gone with Lewis Riddick, who interviewed, who was the only of the four GM candidates who didn't in, who didn't have any previous ties to the Giants, the only outside guy, so to speak, even though Gettleman worked for the Panthers. He had, you know, he had worked for the Giants for a decade before that. Uh, if they had gone with Riddick, I'm pretty sure Matt Nagy would have been a finalist, if not the ch- choice for that. It might have come down to Shermer and Nagy, two guys Riddick had worked with dirt, with the Eagles in his past. Uh, there's a very good chance Nagy could have been the Giants coach. And who knows what that would look like. Maybe Shermer would be the Bears coach. Maybe the Bears would have looked at the, their rival, the Vikings, and plucked their offensive coordinator. They, we might be looking at a matchup with the same two coaches this same week and the two guys on different sidelines, which yep. you know, I, lo- I love all the sports writing. I love alternative realities. I love what ifs. Uh, it's a fun thing to do in sports writing. It doesn't really mean anything, but I love what if scenarios, and that's a pretty interesting one. And I really look, like what the Bears have done, and I've been, you know, you can attest to this going back to August. I've been pretty bullish on the Bears all off season. I like the fact they brought in you Allen did. Robinson. Yeah, you did. They I brought in. For it. Yeah, you I'm did. You did. The... <laughs> that's okay. We'll see who has the last laugh on that. Just Free, like there's freezing, the... co- freezing cold takes alert. Exactly. I mean, you look at bringing in Allen Robinson, bringing in Trey Burton, building around Trubisky, bringing in an offensive minded coach uh, to help mentor a young quarterback. Uh, I think Matt Nagy deserves all the credit in the world. I think he has a chance to be a truly elite play caller. But I think we also have to tip our hat to the Bears and to Nagy for the fact that he's developing, I believe, a second year starting quarterback, whereas he would have been working with a 37 year old Eli Manning or potentially they would have drafted Darnold or they would have drafted Allen or Rose in under Lewis Riddick, but I think the Bears were were set up for Matt Nagy to step in and kind of replicate what Andy Reid has built in Kansas City. Yeah, but let's go. I mean, the Bears weren't good. It's not like he inherited a nine and eleven t uh, nine and seventeen. No, they just had a terrific offseason and they have yeah. a young quarterback. Yeah, that's it. That's that, that's it. Which is where the Giants should be in two years. If we're still doing this podcast, maybe we can revisit. Uh, maybe we can revisit this conversation two years from now and let you know if the Giants followed the Bears' plan. Save it to the archives. He's Ryan Dunleavy. I'm Matt Lombardo. Be sure to follow the show on Twitter at Talk is Cheap NYG. He's at RY Dunleavy. And of course, I'm at Matt Lombardo NFL. Again, if you like what you've heard, we'd love if you would subscribe on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Leave us those five star reviews. It really helps us grow the show. And uh, Ryan, I will talk to you Sunday at MetLife. Yep, I'll be I'll be there after a uh, big day of uh non-turkey and non-cranberry sauce and non-Thanksgiving foods. Sounds good. Happy holiday season, everybody. We'll talk to you next week.